What's up, everyone? DRW here. Uh, I'm very lucky to be joined in our first live CEO interview with the CEO of Callan Ventures, Chris Callan. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Dave. And uh, not as always, but certainly a lesson learned. Producer Glenn, you're you're back uh, after the last uh, sound debacle and eight hours of editing to make everyone sound good. Uh, thought we'd bring the source. So. Um, Chris, so I remember I woke up uh, December 17th. I'm sure it's a day that you remember, but I woke up and I was like, okay, who the hell is Callan Adventures and why in the hell are they buying Barnett gas assets? And um, I actually, uh, one, of, one, of your, uh, one of the people who work here uh, knows me and called and said, hey, before you write something horrible about us on Hot Take, I just want to walk you through a couple ideas. And so I said, well, I mean, if we're going to get a podcast, there's nobody better to have on than, than the horse to, uh, to give it to us straight. So let's start with the Devin Barnett deal. I know, I know it hasn't closed yet, so there's going to be things you can't say, but gas thesis, Devin, why you like that asset and tell, tell listeners what, what that asset is. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, we're very bullish on gas, obviously, and uh, we think natural gas is sort of the unsung hero of you know hydrocarbons and energy for the world and when you really look at what natural gas offers the planet it's pretty amazing and i think a lot of people focus very much on you know either oversupply if they're in the the financial community you know there's too much gas it's coming from everywhere or if you're if you're more on the green side well it's it's still a hydrocarbon it's still producing carbon and it releases methane and there's things about it that aren't perfect and and there's no perfect fuel first of all let's let's be honest mm -hmm. even if you have a renewable you know <laughs> yeah. to make a battery it's a lot of acid and by the way when the sun's not shining there's no energy right so um there's there's no perfect fuel let's just agree on that yeah and then and then say well what does natural gas bring to the table i think it offers something that is incredibly robust it can be used as a transportation fuel a heating fuel an electricity generator um, and it's it's cheap. It's really cheap, and that's important because it it makes uh, the U.S. competitive. It makes the world economies more competitive. It creates jobs. Um, it's relatively clean, um, and so you know for the same amount of energy, you can burn you know 40 to 50 percent less carbon. Um, it's becoming very transferable in the form of liquidified natural gas, and so it it can be moved all over the planet relatively cheaply than it's ever been. Um, and it, right now, it's 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 really coming into its own. And so we believe the decade of 2020 onward is really a decade of natural gas. We're really excited about that. With regards to the Barnett, um, our thesis is really about uh, finding, first of all, betting on natural gas, and then secondly, betting on assets which have very low risk uh, profiles. The, the Barnett was the first real unconventional play. That's where it all started. It's yeah. the grandfather of all kind of unconventional plays. And as we looked around, um, in our portfolio, we, we really felt, A, we needed a, another stool, uh, leg to the stool. Um, we needed uh, a play that we could have low risk on. The, the Barnett's been producing a lot of the horizontal wells for over 15 years. What that means is you have huge predictability, statistical predictability on the declines. It gives us real certainty around what we're going to produce. And if you think where that gas is going to go, it's going to go to LNG in yeah. a large part. Yeah. And what do you need for LNG? You need real predictable supply because the countries importing that, like Japan, yeah. are paranoid of not having cargoes right. because if your country runs on it so we think it makes a lot of sense we bought it we think is a competitive price uh, Devin wanted to focus more on oil we want to go into gas it was a win-win sort of deal and um, and I think it's gonna gonna make a lot of money in the future because there's still huge reserves there okay so so that's great because that I think tees up a lot of the places I wanted to go uh, so thank you for that Let's start with uh, a little bit more about Calendon Ventures. So this isn't your only asset. You are bullish gas. You've been building a gas portfolio. Talk to us about the other asset, the pre-Devon asset, what that is, where that is, and, and you know, op versus non-op, and how that positions you for the, the natural gas revolution, which you know, I, I definitely agree natural gas has to be the fuel of the future in terms of providing energy. And what we'll talk about is what happens at two dollars and twenty cents. So let's let's start with a little bit more about Calvin Ventures. Yeah. So this company is sort of a, a dream opportunity where Bonpu got together, and we'll talk about you know Bonpu, our investor from Thailand, um, a coal and power company that wanted to get into U.S. gas. Um, but I, I started the company with my wife, uh, 2014. How does that? I, I, my wife, I, she would definitely not work with me, and she absolutely doesn't want to come on the podcast. How's working with your wife? You know, it's sort of, uh, it's bittersweet, if I can say that. My wife is really a good counterweight to me because I'm a very extreme personality, and so she sort of keeps me sane. 
at the same time, you know, when we kind of get uh, on loggerheads about something, it, it really is a, it kind of has a, a spillover effect into your marriage. Right. So, so is there, is there like, I disagree with you and you're on the couch tonight? Has that ever happened? Um, Probably not the couch, but uh, go stay in the basement for a long, long time before you come to bed. Um, I, I think, look, with my wife and I, we've sort of uh, come to peace about how we work together. I think from her side, it's really about supporting the business, being there when she needs to be, um, and then giving me a lot of like sage, you know, hey, I know you well enough to know how to respond advice sort of thing. Yeah. And I think that's her role uh, right now. Um, my, you know, And then we, we decided to do this business just because she knew that I was a serial entrepreneur and I got, had to do something, right? I had all these ideas as a consultant. I needed to go out and say, it was kind of like that, that episode of Seinfeld where George decides to do everything opposite of what he should do right, or what he wants to do well. today. And it worked out really well. So yeah. I, I worked in a lot of Fortune 500 companies and yeah. I decided, okay, I've, I've got a list of things of not to do and I'm going to do the opposite of those and see what happens. And that's the, that's the sort of the genesis of the company here. You know, we're, we're not going to have a lot of um, uh, BS around hierarchy and yeah. Um, we're gonna we're gonna allow really rapid decision making, and and we're not going to um, we're not going to tolerate just doing things because that's what everyone's done, and and we're gonna think out of the box, and so that's sort of the the genesis of the company. Um, we got together with Banpu Banpu, who's been an incredible investor. We put together this portfolio you mentioned in, in Northeast Pennsylvania, and we we our, our history is contrarian. Like everything we've done is like contrarian. Right. Like my I'm contrarian. Like my whole upbringing is contrarian. Right. I'm half Thai, half Canadian. My wife's from Colorado. My kids grew up you know, in Denver, but my son was born in Bangkok. It's like nothing normal. Right, right. And so everything we do is sort of a little bit off, um, off from the, the beaten path, if you will. But uh, we started the company. We thought it would be great to look at assets all over the United States. We looked at every play, 40 of them, and we, we landed on Northeast Pennsylvania. And we were like, at the time it was 2015, and we're looking for stuff that we could buy that made economic sense, meaning you can buy it, you can produce it and you get a return all through the cycle. Not yeah. like funny money, half cycle, right. partial cycle, let's exclude GNA sort of math, right? I mean, it's like, let's put all the numbers together, add everything up. What did you make? What did you? What did it cost you to make that? And then what's the cash flow and, and what do you generate? And Northeast Pennsylvania was one of those plays where right. we're like, we found this hidden gem, sort of like money ball, right? You sort of get out there, you look at the math and you say, well, wait a minute, this thing's making money. And and is that position an operator position or non-op position? So we started non-op yeah. and then we decided we got to go operate. Yeah. And and we were, we were had this thesis that non-op was the way to go. And the problem was a lot of the operators that we were working with just weren't doing what we consider rational economic decisions. Right. They were filling FT or filling FT. They were highly levered. They had other priorities going on. Right. As a non-operator, you're sitting there saying, "Well, this doesn't make money. Why, why are you doing this?" Or let's do this. It does make money. And right. They're like, "No, we can't do that because of X, Y, and Z reasons." Now, uh, my recollection, and I haven't spent a ton of time on the Marcellus because I've quite honestly, until December 17th, I hadn't spent a lot of time in the last year thinking about natural gas. Um, the the old thesis certainly 2012 13 was you're closest to all the markets in in the U S and therefore you were getting a premium and yet uh, you know Marcellus Gas has really grown from what three BCF a day to kind of 30 35 BCF a day since 2010 and that premium I think has has turned into a discount correct and so then you also have 220 gas so 220 gas with some level of discount I know the Marcellus is you know the gas play clearly the growth shows it how do the economics work you know and and what should investors and, and listeners expect in 2020 as gas stays at 220 the winter hasn't been cold lot storage is on average but you know there's probably an argument in April to look at a dollar fifty dollar sixty dollar seventy do, do guys shut in gas uh, how, how do you see the gas market evolve from a pricing? Because I agree with you, it is the fuel of the future, but at 220 less a discount, it's hard to see how those economics work. So curious your thoughts, you're very close to it. Yeah, I, I kind of look at gas where the airline industry was sort of in the early 2000s, right? You know, you had too many carriers, you had too much supply in the market, and everyone just got out there and tried to sell more seats cheaper. And so what did that do? It made to airline prices like ridiculous, you could fly to like across the country for a couple hundred bucks right. maybe or less, right? And so that was just not sustainable. And so what happened, the industry consolidated, people added things like Economy Plus and they took seats out of the market and, and then things stabilized. And now you look at routes and you're like, okay, I can check between Southwest and United and it's the same price basically. Right. Um, gas is like that. The reason we are struggling is not because of the demand. You know, what people forget is demand is growing actually very fast. 
um, and low prices stimulate more demand. So yeah. from a market perspective, if I wasn't an investor, I'd say low prices are the best thing for us right now because we're getting the demand growth that we've wanted in gas and yeah. it's happening, right? Yeah. But the problem is there's a number of producers out there that are really struggling and in order for them to keep their numbers up as prices go down, the only way, the only lever they really have is to produce more. Right. And in fact, that exacerbates the situation. So if you look at Northeast Pennsylvania, for example, or even Appalachia as an entire play area, um, producers there are all, a lot of them, majority very sick. They're, they're over levered, they're under way, way more FT or firm contracts than they can sustain. Uh, they've got huge shareholder pressure and they're at $2 gas. So right. what, is that gonna, what does that imply? That implies we need consolidation. It implies we need some bankruptcies to happen, right. guys to get out of the market. And we just need to start stop producing. You know, when you see people still drilling in this market, that's your sign of a sick industry. Right. Because at two dollar gas, I can tell you, no play makes money. You know, oil, a gas uh, directed play, an oil play that's trying to drill for oil, sure. But if you're drilling for gas at two dollars and you you think that's making money, then I'd like to see that math because uh, we're in some of the best rock in Northeast Pennsylvania, and I can tell you, we're not drilling next year. Yeah. So I mean, a that I totally agree with you. I mean, I've I've felt that our industry people talk about a crisis of low commodity prices, and I say it's a crisis of balance sheets. And that exactly on the gas side, I remember 2006 being around the Rockies and CBM. That the amount of firm transport, firm transport is is like basically a company killer. It's like the crack cocaine of. It is the oil crack cocaine, and, and amazing. <laughs> it's still amazing to me that people like you. It's it's the only thing an investor really needs to understand, and yet it doesn't really show up on the balance sheet it's like those old gulf of mexico platforms yeah. you used to have the weird leases that the off balance sheet leases so that that liability never showed up on your balance sheet and when you look at the balance sheets of these gas producers and then add in the ft yeah i mean you have to believe chapter 11 is coming a lot so so you would see that as a buying opportunity through the restructuring and i take it um talk more about your investor and and their their view and then and you touched a little bit on natural gas demand is growing and that low prices stimulate demand. 25% uh, of the electricity in the United States is created by coal. We see coal decommissioning happening all the time. Maybe also talk about the natural gas power generation, what you see and, and how that market evolves over the next three to five years and what it does to coal. Yeah, so let's start with our investor. Our investor is a coal and power, predominantly coal and power company out of uh, based out of Bangkok, but really their assets are in Australia, Indonesia, China, et cetera. And, and they're, you know, in 2000, early to 2010, 2011, they were getting price dumped on them on coal in China. And they sort of looked at that and said, what the heck's going on? And, and so they, they're a coal producer. They're a coal producer. Do they own power plants as well? Yes. Okay. So full chain on the coal Full side. chain on the coal side yeah. and, and obviously emerging on the gas side. And so they worked backwards to the coal prices in China being depressed because of U.S. coal producers dumping it because of U.S. unconventional shale gas right. pressuring the coal producers. So what did they do? Being the smart investor, they worked back to that and said, well, wait a minute, if this is a real trend, we need to be investing aggressively in this. And that's sort of the genesis of how we got together. So they worked backwards from China, coal, all the way to U.S. shale gas, finding out that that was the source of the competition right. and decided if you can't beat them, join them. And so that's really the, the start of it. I, I think it was a very sophisticated approach to strategy. They've been very um, willing to invest counter cyclically. Yeah. Um, they've been in the business. They know that, you know, they tell you in business school, buy low, sell high. Right now is low, buy, right. and then at some point it's it's gonna come back. So is it fair to say, just based on their experience and the, the counter cyclical nature of the bet, that a full integration on the natural gas power side with the natural gas production is a place that you might go given that the coal market is, I mean, that's what they've done? Yeah, I mean, if you look at where margins are captured, right? We do this value chain analysis. You say, okay, I get this much money from moving it from under the ground to the surface. Yeah. Then I get this much money from moving it from the surface in a pipe to the next point in the pipe. And then I do something with that hydrocarbon. In this case, if I'm burning it into steam, right? And converting it into uh, electricity, how much money can I make off selling electricity? And what you find is at every stage, there's quite a bit of margin that's taken off the table. Mm -hmm. So the actual producers don't make that much money. And so as we've started to look at opportunities, vertical integration is very interesting. You know, getting all the way into like, let's get to end users. Let's sell to folks who are actually using and, and consume that energy and how, how much margin can we do and how hard is it for us to do that? Um, 
it's not that hard actually. You yeah. just have to want to do it. And right now in the US, we've got such segmented capital that says you need to play in this sandbox, you don't go in that sandbox, right. that you're, a lot of folks are very constrained with how they can play in that, that, that vertical uh, stack. We, on the other hand, have huge amounts of flexibility. We, right. we, we've talked to our investors and they say, no, we get it, we think it makes sense. And so if you've got that flexibility on the capital side, and that's really, really what's holding people back, is yeah. your money says, don't do that. Yeah. Whereas our money says, do the smartest thing and make as much money as possible. So on the, on the natural gas power generation, you know, I've heard a lot of rumors, again, you talked about it in the opening on, it doesn't, it's not always sunny, it's not always windy, batteries are expensive to, to make uh, a solar panel, you need something called an electric arc, which, you know, just sounds very energy intensive. How much surplus natural gas capacity, like how much additional switching could occur if coal just went away with existing? And then how much new plant uh, infrastructure would get built? And how do you see... Uh, Calnan sort of playing in that. Is it a build a power plant and, and source it close and, and do that? Or is it buy existing infrastructure from a utility company, I presume, who's, who owns it? Yeah, well, so the con let's start with the second question. The concept of integrating into the economics of a power plant aren't unique, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of producers today looking at net back pricing where you kind of price off electricity, PGM, et cetera, uh, and get that price converted in some sort of heat rate. And so that's not unique. But the idea that you can really play in various uh, types of capital structures in that area is unique. And, you know, for us, uh, we, we would look at all the above. We've looked at everything from a greenfield build a power plant from the ground up, right, and serve a market, to is there stuff out there to, to buy? And yeah. so um, the answer is yes to both. And okay. I think what we're looking at is what is the best risk adjusted and most efficient way to get that. Um, I think buying probably makes a lot more sense in this market. There yeah. are a number of power plants available to be purchased, and we have the reserves to supply those power plants. Yeah. And that does a, it does a win-win thing because as a power plant, you're concerned about your number one cost, which is gas, Fuel. if you're yeah. a, a gas-fired power plant. Yeah. And so if you've got that locked in for 20 years, guess what? You can go get bonds that are dirt cheap, mm -hmm. right? And then if you're a producer, if you've got a buyer that's going to be 20 years buying you at a, a floored price of something, boy, that's pretty good too. So right. it's absolutely win-win to do something like that. That makes sense. Um, on your second question around sort of how much future runway do we have on the power side for gas? Um, we've got quite a bit. I mean, you know, coal definitely, there are some coal-fired pilot plants that are very, very um, competitive to, uh, to any product because they're, 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 they're there, they've been along, they're really efficient. But yeah. if you look at the new generation of power plants coming out, um, I would argue that you could pretty much get to low single digits in terms of percentage coal of electricity generated. And that's a lot more running room right. for yeah, gas than we've another used. 16 kind of percent. Exactly. So you touched on LNG, and then we're going to pivot back to the Barnett and over to the Permian for a second. But, but on the LNG, so uh, I'm by no means an expert, but as we've grown LNG, uh, the, the criticism of LNG being you know, a tree that can grow to the sky is that China had sort of been preparing to move to a lot, a lot more natural gas uh, fired power generation and have instead sort of done coal scrubbing, which is cleaner and cleaning their air. And so maybe we're not seeing the same coal to gas switching in China as might have been expected. And then secondarily, with the treaty that allowed Russian gas, I think, to go through the Ukraine into Europe, they were, that had to get re-signed and there was some speculation as to whether it would or wouldn't and some LNG had moved into Europe that, that maybe you know, was higher rate now that that treaty has been signed, you know, it's back to normal course. So both of those things say that some of the LNG growth has been maybe artificial. How do you see that? Because a lot of U.S. producers would say, don't worry, we'll just, we'll produce it all and export it all and LNG is the future. Do you have a similar view or, or what would you say to respond to my uh, criticism, I guess, of LNG growth? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, for me, LNG, first of all, starts off as uh, is it a competitive fuel, right? Because if you're, um, you know, if, if you're South, a, a Southeast Asian country like Thailand, for example, you've got different choices of fuel. And so you've got gas uh, in the form of LNG and you've got renewables and you've got, you know, oil and you've got, uh, you know, coal, et cetera. So um, the question is how competitive is LNG? I can tell you right now where the price points of LNG are, it's dang competitive. Let me give you an example from Thailand because I know that market pretty well. Yeah. The Gulf of Thailand, the call on gas prices is somewhere six to seven dollars an MMBTU for the Gulf of Thailand production as we get more marginal. LNG can be landed at a spot rate tonight today sub five. Okay. So LNG is cheaper. It's cheaper for Thailand right now to import LNG 
than it is to pull their own gas from the Gulf of Thailand because of the economics associated with that. Mm -hmm. And so what that tells you is the low price of LNG is actually stimulating more and more demand. We're up to 40 plus countries that are importing LNG. It used to be a handful. You could count them literally on two hands how many countries were importing LNG. And that's a really good sign. It means that more and more folks are adding this into portfolio. And you got to think about energy as a portfolio, right? right? So this idea of China sort of just going to LNG is, is in my view, a fantasy. It's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. China is going to have LNG as part of their portfolio of energy, but they're going to have a portfolio. And that's always going to be the case. Right. Um, what I say is the biggest constraint we have to LNG growth is actually infrastructure. And so to your point, what I would be looking deeper into the into the longer term future would be are folks building out pipelines and infrastructure that can absorb and distribute that gas infrastructure across their econ economies. Countries like Japan, Korea, um, South Korea, and uh, Taiwan already have that infrastructure. Thailand already has that infrastructure. Yeah. But for countries like uh, China, India, more emerging countries, Vietnam, that don't have that gas infrastructure, that's the critical determinant of whether LNG will really take off or not. Well, it's it's interesting. I'll, I'll throw in a conspiracy theory before we shift into the Barnett. But, you know, there was a, there's a lot of talk, and it's amazing. There's always a financial backer, some financial driving behind everything that's in the news. And so in the last two weeks, you've certainly seen a lot more increased talk of flaring. And uh, to me, anyway, when I think about potential Russian interference in the election, depending on what you say, but when Vladimir Putin says that I am that fracking in the U.S. is horrible, well, 67 percent of the natural gas produced in our country that can be exported for LNG that would displace Russian gas that's currently going to Europe at high prices, it would be very convenient if fracking was banned because in that case, Russia owns the entire market and they drive their economy. So, you know, as I think about conspiracy theories and, and some of this stuff, that's one of them. But I touched on flares, which have been coming in the media a lot more in the last two weeks. And, you know, certainly we talk about the environmental impact of that oversupply of gas. What do you think about the problem of flaring in particular in the Permian, but flaring in the world? And, and how, do, how does a company like yourself address it? Um, and how do we as a, as a country and regulatory bodies, how do we look at solving the flaring issue is probably a pretty easy way to, to reduce our climate change impact. Yeah, I mean, I have a pretty simple view on this. Flaring is bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's bad because it, it, it destroys long-term value, right? What The idea of a flare is that, you know, you've got, if you're oil dr drilling for oil and you're producing for oil, you've got this byproduct. Is there's an expense associated with trying to capture that byproduct, i.e. natural gas and some liquids with that, and moving it into um, a distribution system. Yeah. And the reality is that's a short-term phenomenon that over time your, your wells are going to have gas coming out of them over and over again and you've got to be able to monetize that because you're, you're destroying value for the landowner first of all uh, you're adding uh, emissions into the environment and you're doing it at a very short-term looking view and I don't I don't see that as you know we saw that problem in the Bakken for example right and we see now that a lot of that infrastructure is getting built out and I see that that's where we have to go as an industry I mean you can't look people in the eye and say, we're burning your natural gas. Oh, by the way, that's taking off your royalty payments and, and we're not going to move that to market when the market does want that natural gas in the long term. So I, I think you've got to, you've got to, you got to capture it. You've got to move it into the system. You've got to treat it and you got to prevent it from escaping to the atmosphere. Do you think the RRC, uh, which obviously will impact the Barnett, although it's a gas play, do you think that they'll step up and make some regulatory changes like they've done in the Bakken to mandate, you know, less percentage of flaring? Do you think, is that the solution, regulatory? You know, you can you can look at it different ways, right? I'm not going to say, I'm not a big fan of, you know, well, the government's going to step in and make everything right because we know how that sometimes, right. and most often plays most out. Most often plays out. Uh, I would say it starts with consolidation. I think you need to get responsible producers consolidating those plays. If you have the major step in, they obviously are ones to really be on the front foot of capturing that gas and moving it through a distribution system. Um, and I think that's where the Permian is going to end up. So I think naturally market forces are going to get you there to a large extent anyways. Right. Um, what the Railroad Commission ends up doing, I cannot say, I, and I'm not familiar enough with it. Yeah. But I, what I think is we've got the, the momentum around the market forces, and I think we'll get there. Great. So so let's let's close sort of talking about the Barnett and your Barnett position. So it's as, as I read, it's about $600 million a day. Which right. is which is a huge position and kind of four TCF is that in the that range? Sounds about right. Yeah. Okay, and and so that's got to be thousands of well bores. How how as as P, as
as the business model evolves, and, and I'll call it private equity 3.0, certainly you're part of that with a different funding source. But as guys think about PDP driven yield vehicles, one of the things that comes to mind are these orphan wells and thousands of wells that have abandonment liability and, and managing that. As you look through the process of buying this asset from Devon, how did you factor in just the well bore liability and the number of wells required and where economic limits were and what you can do to consolidate that. So let's start with the liability. Number one, well, Devon has done a tremendous job of taking care of these wells. And so we've been very impressed with the amount of uh, infrastructure and or care and maintenance that they've done. Um, and so we think that that limits the liability to some extent, but you always have with, with pre older producing wells some sort of liability. I think that's that's part of the package, right? You're an EMP producer, uh, you, you've just got to get comfortable with a lot of uh, maintenance and care and integrity and spot checks and um, compliance checks, et cetera. And that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to maintain that high quality standard that Devin set in the Barnett uh, for those assets. Uh, with regards to really hitting the economics, for me, this is the the Barnett is the biggest leading indicator we have of how other plays are going to evolve. You yeah, know? they're basically where everyone's going. If if you look at an old Jage home, you know, you go in there, walk around, that's where you're going to end up <laughs> at some point. So you may better get familiar with how that all works, right? Um, and that's really what we see. Uh, for me, it's about automation, automation technology, and this is something that I feel like is really under emphasized in the industry today. And and what I would say is. There are technologies today, and we saw this in the automotive fan, uh, manufacturing in the 70s and 80s when everyone came in with robotics and they started to automate the assembly lines and it made huge productivity improvements for U.S. Um, auto manufacturing. Um, this is where our industry is going. Our industry is looking at, and the technology exists. This is not, I'm not making it up. Yeah. It's just about um, combining it in a way that solves business problems. Everybody looks at it very point solution. I want something that optimizes my plunger lift system. But that's not what you're trying to solve for. I'm trying to solve for in our business in the Barnett and as we grow into other play areas, it's really about solving for automating the wells. The wells, a natural gas or oil producing well should be automated. It should only be touched by a human being when there's something really wrong that's happened. Yeah. Otherwise, it should be producing itself and computers should be running those things because yeah. they can do it way better than a human. And that's where we're going and we're investing heavily against that. We think that's going to give us a competitive advantage. So uh, I know all the listeners are, are very curious about this. Do you and your wife drive into work together or do you take separate cars? Um, we drive separately. My wife has, it's funny, we try to balance out the, the we're, we're kind of like these dichotomies in, 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 in who we are as a couple and, and, and how we do business. So I drive a Tesla, uh, completely electric, um, no carbon footprint um, with regards to emissions once you've bought it, right? Before then they had to make the batteries and right. do all sorts of bad stuff to get there. but. Um, and then uh, my wife drives uh, an Expedition Max, right? So good old fashioned American right, Ford. And that's the uh, oil and gas family right there. There you go. So we, we try to represent and we drive separately and she's got you know four kids to lug around and I've got my briefcase. That's great. Uh, Glenn, did we miss anything that, that you think that we, we really need to dive into? Uh, no, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, when, I, when Chris and I first met, you know, the main uh, one of the main drivers or differentiators for that you'd even mentioned before was your technology and how you guys apply that. And that's uh, the basis for when you came and spoke at Intercom, yeah? Yep. So, I, and we've kind of touched on that. So it's been great so far. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that you've, you've certainly opened my eyes to the thesis. And, and I like hearing, you know, the reality that at 220, there's not a lot of drilling and, and you would advocate that people shouldn't drill and that drilling is actually a leading indicator of a, of a sick company and that we're going to see a lot more restructuring on the natural gas side and through that restructuring restructuring the firm transport we're going to end up in a much better position so that over the next 10 years natural gas is the fuel of the future and that with your investors and with the company strategy around building gold, gas power getting along the full value chain and identifying great natural gas assets that are predictable to be able to fuel a long life bet that's that's where you're playing this game and and to me that makes a tremendous amount of sense and i think it also talks to why there's a bifurcation of the super majors on consolidation who can drive some of these permian flaring and just low cost on the public side and then there's a space for large private investors who can take a much 
differentiated view to the public markets that isn't a quarter to quarter thing. Yeah. F fair to say? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Uh, it was great. Really enjoyed getting to, getting to know you and having the chat. And um, I'll make sure the next time we interview your wife so she can validate all the things that you said and, and tell us some stories about uh, what cooking is like in the Callan family. Oh, yeah, sure will. Um, thanks, David. Thanks, Glenn. You guys have been great. Great. Appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank yeah. you.